If you have your copy of the scriptures with you, would you turn with me to the last book in the Old Testament, the book of Malachi, chapter 3. And as my, as my turn coming up to the pulpit is um, somewhat sporadic, um, uh, the better part of wisdom has not been to launch out into a new series of messages, um, but I had run across uh, in my collection a number of meditations that came from this wonderful book of Malachi that in, in a way kind of act as vignettes. So though we won't be doing a systematic study of the book of Malachi, I trust that the passage before us will be something of uh, a challenge to each of us. So I'd like you to take a look at Malachi chapter 3, and this morning we're going to focus just on verse 6, and then I'll pray once more, all right? Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6. I trust this will be a familiar theme to those of you who've been in Sunday school. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Let's go to our God in prayer, shall we? And Father, we're glad once more to be uh, opening the scriptures. We pray that you, Holy Spirit, would, would use this word for the purpose for which it was intended to bless and challenge us, O oh God, uh, in our own walk with you and our service to your people. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you know anything about the book of Malachi, as you know, it is the last book of the Old Testament. The people of God, having suffered terribly by the hands of the Chaldeans, were wonderfully restored to their homeland. This was, of course, in fulfillment to God's promise to them through uh, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 29, verse 10, that their captivity would be limited to 70 years. And yet, once they came home, at least some of these Jews had slipped back, even into sorcery, to adultery, taking wives from among their idolatrous neighbors, oppressing their own countrymen, and other concerns as well. How given to change we are. How fleeting is our devotion to God. On Sunday, we may find our hearts warmed to the Lord as we sit under the preaching and as we sing together. And later in the week, a few days later, we're caught up in the love of this world or even slip back into some former sinful pattern. By contrast, God reminds these Jews that he does not change. They and their fathers were unfaithful to the covenant they made with God on Sinai. And, uh, and yet God is still unchanging. So we're going to focus on this verse under three heads. First, God's immutability. Secondly, we're going to brief and examine those who benefit from God's immutability. And third, the specific benefits they, they derive from God's immutability. This outline was originally used, as I said, by Charles Haddon Spurgeon while preaching at the New Park Chapel, New Park Street Chapel in January of 1855. So if there's any benefit that you get from this, you can reflect back upon the useful servant who served the church in a former century. First, if you uh, take a look at your outline, God is immutable. In other words, God does not change. First, we want to take a look at under part A. God does not change in his essence, in his being. Have you ever considered for the fact that you are not the same person that you were physically even a year ago? Scientists tell us that 98% of the atoms in our bodies are replaced every year. Our physical essence changes that much. Our cells regenerate on average every seven to ten years. However, God's essence, in other words, who he is, never changes. We read in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and 
forever. Thank God for that. We read in the book of Revelation where the Lord Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and is to come, the Almighty. Recall with me that God is spirit, we learned in the adult Sunday school class recently. That is, he is immaterial, pure, and therefore independent of his physical creation. He is the great I am. James writes in chapter 117, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Spurgeon comments, he remains everlastingly the same. There are no furrows in his eternal brow. No age has palsied him. No years have marked him with the mementos of their flight. He sees ages pass, but with him it is ever now. He is the great I am, the great unchangeable. Jesus Christ did not change in his essence, in the essence of his deity, when he took on human nature to be that babe in Bethlehem taking upon himself flesh and blood and becoming the second Adam did not alter the essence of his divine nature. And so God, the Father, Son, and Spirit never change in their essence. But to your outline as well, part B, God never changes in his attributes. He never changes in his attributes. I'll run through some of those for you now. Whatever God possessed in eternity past His attributes are now and ever shall be the same. First, God's power shall never change. He'll never have a backache or have his hand stiff from arthritis, nor weaken uh, because he no longer can tolerate this or that food, as some of us have experienced. Still as powerful as when he laid the foundations of the universe and set the stars in motion. God's power is unchanging. God's wisdom also is undiminished with each passing passing year. God is not informed by this or that new perspective that each generation thinks they have. His plan of salvation is still wiser than the wisdom of this world as it was from all eternity. God's justice remains unchanged. He is Uh, holy eternally, and the arm of his justice remains unchanged. God's truth is the same. What God has promised, he will bring it certainly to pass. He does not vary in his goodness and generosity. He has been and always will be benevolent in his nature. All eternity will be needed to show us his kindness to us, who are in Christ Jesus, if you look at Ephesians 2, 7. God's love also is is as unchanging as it is eternal, as we learn in Sunday school this morning. Spurgeon comments, "He, he was not become an almighty tyrant when he once was an almighty father, but his strong love stands like a granite rock, unmoved by the hurricanes of our iniquity. And blessed be his dear name, he is unchanged in his love. When he first wrote the covenant, how full his heart was with affection to his people. He knew that his son must die to ratify the articles of that agreement. He knew right well that he must rend his best beloved from his bowels and send him down to earth to bleed and die. He did not hesitate to sign that mighty covenant, nor did he shun its fulfillment. He loves as much now as he did then. And when suns shall cease to shine and moons show their feeble light, he still shall love on forever and forever. Praise God. God is also unchanging in his plans. Part C on your outline, in his plans. I reflect back when Mark and I had gone to Zimbabwe, our visits there had been after the the financial crash of 2008 in that country. And we would pass building after building that were merely just a shell of what the intended structure was. 
They were able to start a project, but they were never able to bring it to completion. And how many times has the Coatesville Redevelopment Plan had its fits and starts? There are still projects that are yet to begin there. But that is not so with our God. God never began a work that he in his omnipotence could never bring to completion. His wisdom anticipated every difficulty and nimbly addressed it. And of course, I'm speaking in human terms in that regard. At the close of the creation week, we read that in Genesis 2.2, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. Regarding God the Son in John 17, our Lord Jesus prayed, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He finished that work. And not long after that, you know, our Lord Jesus, um, uh, when Jesus had received the sour wine dying on the cross, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He had accomplished the, the salvation that he came to do. We read of this spirit, Philippians 1.6. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. So the triune Godhead devised a plan of salvation, a covenant of redemption before the worlds were made and it has been accomplished. And so there is no man that can stand in the way of his plans coming to fruition. There is no devil in the abyss that can alter God's decree. Again, Spurgeon, God's iron hand of destiny marks it down and brings it to pass. There is never a need to change his plans. They were forged by his eternal wisdom and hammered out by his omnipotent power. He may change your plans and my plans, but he shall never, never change his. God has said that he would save you through Christ. Then you are safe. As Augustus' top lady has written, my name from the palms of his hands, eternity will not erase. Impressed on his heart, it remains in marks of indelible grace. Yes, I to the end shall endure as sure as the earnest is given, more happy but not more secure when all earthly ties have been riven. So God is unchanging in his plans. But D, we move on, he's also unchanging in his promises. When I think of promises that I have made and then have later had to go back on that promise because of this or that difficulty that I uh, did not anticipate, I reminded that this can never happen to God, who knows the end from the beginning, as we read in Hebrews, uh, rather in Isaiah 46.10. In Hebrews, we read, um, so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for him to lie, we have fled for refuge. We who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. Paul again explains in 2 Corinthians um, to the church at, at Corinth there in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 of his uh, difficulty in coming to visit them. He says, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. For God the Son, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him is always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. And that is why it is through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. So there are certain times in our lives when we may have felt very shaken. But it isn't it also true that if the ground under our feet is God's word, that rock is not shaken. Perhaps maybe our adherence to it is. 
Like Peter, who stepped out onto the waves as he stepped out of the boat, we focused on the waves and wind and not on our Savior and his bidding in its implicit promise to keep us safe. So remember that every promise is a rock under your feet and mine, an unchanging thing. And so we may cling to that as a rock in the midst of your stormy life. But not only are God's promises unchanging, part E, so are his threats unchanging. His threats are unchanging. Not only are God's promises unchanging, but his threats as well. Every one shall be fulfilled. We only need to recall the sad history of Israel and Judah's departure from the living God to worship the idols of the surrounding nations to see this reality. The monarchy, the priesthood, the temple sacrifices, the army were all swept away by Assyria and Babylon. Numerous prophets spoke the word of the Lord to the nation which had become complacent and cast off the worship of Yahweh for the gods of Baal and Asherah. And so all those curses of Deuteronomy had had come to pass. And so the God of the Old Testament, remember, is the God of the New Testament. We read in, in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And we see that also fulfilled in Revelation 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Our Lord Jesus in, in, um, in having that discussion with Nicodemus in John 3, John records from that conversation, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Our Lord Jesus, after he rose from the dead, in Mark 16, writes this, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And so the holy God takes no pleasure in the torments of the wicked, but that they should turn from their crimes and turn back to him, trusting alone in the forgiveness that is found in Jesus Christ alone. And so we've looked at, under Roman number one, we've looked at the immutability of God, of his essence, of his attributes, of his plans, his promises, and his threats. Let's consider, under Roman numeral two, those who benefit from God's immutability. We observe in our verse that God specifically addresses those who are the objects of his unchanging love. He says, you sons of Jacob. God's elect are here in meant by the sons of Jacob, those whom God foreknew and foreloved and foreordained to everlasting salvation. Well, what do we consider about them? First, under part A, they are God's children by election. If you would turn with me to Romans chapter 9 for a moment, this is a passage that Pastor Mitch opened up to our understanding in recent months. Romans chapter 9. And if you would turn down, and I'll begin reading at verse 8 of Romans chapter 9. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Verse 9. For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but of him who calls, verse 12, she was told the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, 
but Esau I have hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. If you flip back to chapter 8, a well-known verse, 29. For those whom he foreknew, in other words, foreloved, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. John Newton used to tell the whimsical story and laugh at it too of a good woman who said in order to prove the doctrine of election she would say ah sir the Lord must have loved me before I was born or else he would not have anything in me to love afterwards and that's true for all of us isn't it so we've considered the fact that these are God's children by election under part B, these are also people of unusual experiences as well. People of unusual experiences. Recall with me, after Jacob left his home uh, with Isaac and Rebekah, who God appeared to him as he slept. In a vision, Jacob saw angels ascending and descending upon a ladder which came down from heaven. And when he awoke, from the dream, he named the place Bethel, or the house of God. He covenanted with God that he would honor him all his days and that God would show his kindness to him. Years later, recall that while journeying back home, Jacob wrestled with God all night. Well, and, that while, and that while journeying home um, uh, at that point, and the Lord put his hip out of joint, and then the angel of the Lord gave Jacob a new name. No longer would he be characterized as the supplanter or swindler, for that he was, but Israel, in other words, a prince who prevails with God. And so too are all the believers who are in Christ Jesus. They also are people of unusual experiences. If you look at Romans 8 again, verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear but you receive the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We also see this in Galatians chapter 4. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so these know something of the love of God, which has been poured out into their hearts by the Spirit who dwells in them. Each one is an heir of God through Jesus Christ. They know something of wrestling with God, of pleading with him that he would forgive them of their sins, though they are many in number. They know something of God drawing near, of bearing witness with their spirits that they are, in fact, children of God. And so the question before us is, can you testify that this is a reality in your life, my hearer. Have you diligently sought God, wrestled with God in prayer, and found him? Does his Holy Spirit dwell in you day by day, transforming you little by little into Christ's likeness? And so like Jacob, who is given this new title of prince, everyone who believes in Jesus has been given the right to become a child of God to those who believe in his name, an heir or an heiress of God. What a blessed honor it is to be an adopted child of God, to have the spirit of adoption dwelling in you. Does that honor belong to you, my hearer, this morning? And so not only are these God's people by election, as we've seen, they are people of, of unusual experience. Part C, they're also people of peculiar trials, as Jacob was. Think of the difficulties that Jacob experienced throughout his life, having deceived his father to obtain a blessing and cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright. He fled from home, never to see his mother again. And then received into his uncle Laban's home, Jacob the swindler had met his match. Laban cheated him out of his wife after laboring for seven years, having switched his bride Rachel for the older daughter Leah. Laban changed his wages seven times. Later, journeying home, he met his brother Esau with 400 armed men coming, up, coming toward him. 
but was graciously received by Esau through God's intervention. And so as time went on, his daughter Dinah had been taken advantage of by one of the men of Shechem, and his sons retaliated by killing all the men in that town. I could go on. We could talk of the loss of Joseph for a time at the hand of his brothers and the near loss of Benjamin, his youngest. This only underscores the special trials that Jacob had experienced in his life. And yet Jacob was not consumed because of God's unchanging person and his decrees. Believer, you may find yourself being knocked down by wave upon wave of trial in your life as well. You too are a people of unusual trials of faith as Jacob was. Our Lord Jesus as well was known as the man of sorrows, afflicted more than you or I myself. Jesus knew mourning and sorrow. We never had trials like his, rejected by his own, though he loved them. You may not grasp the meaning of your trials like Job did for many years, but remember our text in Malachi 3, 6. For I, the Lord, do not change, and therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed." We can also see under part D, these are also people of a very peculiar character as well. The sons of Jacob were of a special character. There are aspects of Jacob's character, obviously, that we cannot commend. And yet God points to those which are commendable. And so as we examine the record in God's word, it is plain that he was a man of prayer. He became a man of prayer. He knew what it was to get alone with God and to pray. He knew what it was um, uh, um, uh, to wrestle with God. We have time to get dressed, but we don't have time to pray. We have time to eat our meals, but we don't have time to pray. We have time for our smartphones, but no time for our God. Prayer is as essential to our spirits as breathing is to our bodies. And so the patriarch was also marked not only by this attitude of prayer, but we can see he's marked out in Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith. He's known as a man of faith as well. We read in chapter 11 of Hebrews verse 21, by faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship before the head of his staff. His faith, no doubt, was tested over the many years and trials that he endured. And here we find him at the end of his days still bowing in reverent worship to his God. A faith that is real is one that endures. It matures through the challenges of life. And you may think, how can I still believe when I've had to endure this abuse or that loss? Well, how do your trials match up with his? Does your faith also line up with Jacob's faith? His was a persevering faith. And so as we've considered not only the immutability of God in his essence, in his attributes, and in his plans, and other things as well, we've considered the people that benefit from God's immutable character. We also want to consider the specific benefit derived as well under Roman numeral number three. First, under part A, special in divine comfort in the storms of life. They are special in divine comfort in the storms of life. We read in Malachi 3 verse 6, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. You are not consumed. Think with me of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If you want to turn there, that would be fine too. Where Solomon catalogs the changes that we experience in this life. I think down to verse 11 of Ecclesiastes 3. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. John Gill comments, that is, God has made everything and all things in creation are made by him for his pleasure and glory. 
and well and why and, and all well and wisely. There is a beauty in them all. So all things in providence. He upholds all things. He governs and orders all things according to the counsel of his will. Some things are done immediately by him, others by instruments, and some are only permitted by him. Some he does himself, some he does, he wills to be done by others, and some he suffers to be done. But in all there is a beauty and harmony, and all are ordered, disposed, and overruled to answer the wisest and greatest purposes. Everything is done in the time in which he wills it to be done, and done in the time most fit and suitable for it to be done. All things before mentioned here, for which there is a time and all others before mentioned. All natural things are beautiful in their season. Things in summer, winter, spring and autumn, frost and snow in winter, heat in summer, darkness and dews in the night, and light in the brightness of the day. And so in 10,000 other things, all afflictive dispensations of his providence, Times of plucking up and breaking down, of weeping, of mourning, of losing and casting away are all necessary and seasonable and beautiful in their issue and consequences. Prosperity and adversity in their turns make a beautiful checker work and work together for good are like Joseph's coat of many colors, which was an emblem of those various providences which attended that good man and were extremely beautiful, as are all the providences of God to men. And all his judgments will be when made known when he has performed his whole work and the mystery of God in providence will be finished, which is like a piece of tapestry when all viewed in parts, no beauty appears in it, Scarce anything to be made of it, but when all is put together, it is most beautiful and harmonious. And as we look down to verse 14 of the same chapter, Solomon writes, Are perceived that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. And yet John Gill can comment as well. And I apologize for the extended comment, but I think it's worthwhile. The decrees of God, which are his works, the thoughts of his heart, that are all to generations the counsel of his will, which always stands and is performed, his mind, which is one, the same always and invariable, and which he never changes, his pleasure he always does, his purposes and appointments, which are always accomplished, never frustrated and made void, for he is all wise in forming them, all knowing and sees the end from the beginning, so that nothing unforeseen can turn up to hinder the execution of them. He is unchangeable and never alters his will, and all powerful, able to effect his great designs and faithful and true, cannot deny himself, nor ever lie, nor repent. So we can see the great benefit of the people of God, those that are God's by election, those in their unusual experience, in their unusual character. They benefit in their times, in their storms of life. They are not consumed by the very mercies of God, which is the next point that I want to make under part B. They are special objects of God's mercy. We should ask, why does Malachi say these original to his original hearers, why they might be consumed, why they might be destroyed forever in the first place? Well, briefly, these have been graciously, graciously restored to Judea following the 70 years of captivity that we mentioned at first. They have despised God's name by offering blind, sick, and lame animals for their sacrifices. They despised the Sabbath ordinances, calling them a weariness. Some married heathen wives and despised their spouses in illegitimate divorces. They robbed God of their tithes. Those who ought to have been deeply, deeply grateful for the tremendous mercy God had shown them are now accusing God of not 
of not quickly coming to their aid when they had troubles with their harvest. They were, in fact, offended by God. They were blind to their lack of love for God, but instead stood in judgment of him. And so does any of this to you sound familiar? Have you considered how God has recently kept you from slipping back into some former sin, any of which would rightly land you in hell if not repented of? I'm not preaching a works righteousness here, of course, but we need to be clear Though we are only saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. But that faith that saves is not alone. How near are any one of us from slipping away into the love of the world, into unbelief of taking, the view, taking on the views and perspectives of the world. And though those thought patterns and practices which once characterized you, made you liable to judgment from which God preserved you. Uh, But like Malachi's hearers, have you become quietly discontent, quietly envying this or that person for the blessings they have, their ease of life, which has not been given to you? Or are you, upon reflection, humbly grateful that Christ has not despised you and drawn you out of the pit of sin from which you came? Why I say this, when I say this, of course, I'm including myself as well. We are all like such dry kindling fit to be consumed by God's wrath, except for his mercies. And I'm so glad that your story and my story does not end there. And here we are this morning in the presence of God, worshiping before him, having received mercy and the grace of faith in Christ. Through his mercies, we are not consumed. His covenant with his beloved still stands unchanged. And so remember this as you leave worship this morning. God is still the same. Whatever has changed or moved in your life, people change. This one departs from your life by providence or is taken in death. Your friends may be disaffected. Everything may change, but God does not. And so some may in time disown you, but God will love you still. Your body will change. You may become sick and frail. But as Spurgeon closes, he remarks, there is one heart which never can alter. There there is one heart which can never alter, and that heart is God's, and his name is love. Trust him, he'll ne'er deceive you. Though you hardly of him deem, he will never, never leave you, nor will he let you quite leave him. Amen. Let's go to him now in prayer, shall we? Lord, even through the course of a day, our opinions change. And we laugh at ourselves and say how foolish and given to change we are, dear God. May that be less so. And as we reflect upon you, dear God, help us to be stabilized by the character of who you are, that you are the God who never changes, that your love is unchanging, that your covenant still stands that all of your decrees will be accomplished and that we never need fear that you will will have a, a good day or a bad day. We never fear of coming before you, wondering whether or not we are yet accepted in Christ because of your great covenant of redemption in him. So stabilize our hearts, dear God, in the midst of our trials, even as you saw, as we see here that you brought Jacob through so many Um, Help our love for you to be more uh, stable and growing, dear Lord, as the months and years wear on. And help us to trust in you even, dear Lord, as we're taken up in glory in our last day in this world. And Father, I pray for those that, that, um, and what I've said this morning is just so strange to them. Dear Lord, I pray that you would draw them out in your great pity and love toward your wonderful love. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we'll, we'll stand and we'll close singing hymn.